Presbyterian Church this morning. We are glad to be together worshiping the Lord. We're glad that you have gathered where you are to worship God with us. And we invite you to worship him in spirit and in truth with us. There are a few announcements that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, one is the session we'll be meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 through Zoom. Uh, they will discuss how we are moving forward with worship services um, and our plan to gather back together when that may be. Um, they will, they're continuing to look at the situation of the virus and uh, look at how things are going and see how we need to respond and how our response in some ways may be different than other places in our county, than other counties and even other states. Right now, we do have an elevated number of cases, and so we as a uh, county and as a session will be looking at that for our church tomorrow evening. Also, a um, Zoom gathering will take place on Tuesday at 7 p.m. for everyone to gather socially. We've been gathering at 7.30 with youth for the past many weeks. This week, we will skip our youth gathering and have all church gatherings. So if you would like uh, to be a part of that, please send me your email so I can send you the invitation so that you would be able to join in. Uh, there is a little bit of work you may have to do ahead of time if you've never been on Zoom before, but after you get that invitation, you would be able to do that. So if you're interested in that, you can respond to me through email or through the, in the event that's on our Facebook page or even post your email comments here if you want to do it that way, and I'll be able to send you that invitation. Let us together worship the Lord. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day, the day that you have made, a day that we rejoice and are glad, a day that we gather together to worship you. Lord, we pray that you would come and inhabit our worship through the Holy Spirit, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth, honoring and glorifying you with our worship. Bless us, Lord, and may our worship be in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading. Jesus Christ summons us to answer God's call of mercy. Christ gathers us and gives us power to be healed and to heal, to be forgiven and to forgive to be freed from sin, and to set others free, to tell one another and the world, God's presence is at hand. Let us worship God. Let us stand together and join our voices in singing hymn 356, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
The mystery of God brings the promise of life. But we doubt the Spirit's power to overcome death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son, reveals that nothing is impossible with God. Let us confess our sin and receive new life. Triune God, Holy Three, Holy One, we confess that we do not know how to look for you. We do not sense your nearness, and if there are angels among us, we are unaware. We do not show the hospital for strangers that ever can show to you. We do not trust that our hardships can be transformed by your spirit. O oh, covenant keeper, forgive us. Let us experience joy because your grace has made peace among us. Send us out with this good news so that others will also receive your blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ gave his life to save us from the wrath of God. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Trust the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. scripture lesson, our scripture lesson today comes from Genesis chapter 18. We'll read verses 1 through 15. Genesis chapter 18 begins. Now the Lord appeared to him, him being Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat and when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And 
I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on, since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. And they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And Abraham said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall indeed, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? The appointed time I will return to you, and this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. This is the word of the Lord. I want to invite the children to come forward and to join me. I think it's interesting here that we see Jesus appear. We see God appear in a way that is not typical. It's not necessarily one of the ways that we've seen God appear before. You see, God appears, and even though it's disputed as to how this happens or it's discussed in understanding it better. We see here that, and we understand that God appears in these travelers, three of them. He appears to Abraham there in Mamre as three travelers. So I wonder if you remember of any ways that God has appeared in the Bible before on earth. Has he ever appeared in a way that you remember in a story, maybe in a different way too, not necessarily in human form. One that always comes to mind for me is the burning bush, where we find and understand God inhabiting the bush and appearing to Moses there on the mountain. Another that I am uh, remember quite easily is the dove. Jesus' baptism, how God appears to the people as the dove. Yeah, we, we agree, and we probably all come to mind that Jesus is God in the flesh, and that the Holy Spirit came down as tongues of fire when, they, when God came to earth to be the comforter for people through the Holy Spirit. But there are other ways, too. You know, God appeared on earth as a wrestler, yeah, you may not realize it, but God actually wrestles with Jacob in Scripture, dislocating Jacob's hip when they're having a discussion about what Jacob will do and how he will follow God. So God appears as a wrestler in the Old Testament. He appears as silence in the cave with Elijah. You know, there's a great rushing wind. Some versions say a tornado comes through. There's fire, and then there's silence. And God appears as silence in that cave to Elijah. He also appears in human form in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you remember, there's this figure. There were three 
thrown in the furnace before appear in the furnace. God appeared in the furnace there with them. God appears throughout Scripture. He appears to the people when they need Him. If you think about it in the wilderness, God's guidance is a pillar of fire and a cloud. A pillar of fire as they walk by night and a cloud as they walk by day. God is continually meeting the people of Israel in the world. He's continually meeting us in the world as well. How do we recognize God when he meets us? Where does God meet us? How does God appear to us? I think those are questions that we have to continue to look in life and wonder. Especially as we are young in the faith. Where do we see God? Where do we see God's message being told? Where do we see God in the world, in creation? I think we see God in many ways, too, in modern medicine. We don't realize that it's God moving and working in the world with healing. We have to, as people of God, continue to look for God, to look for the message of God, to look for the appearance of God. You as young people, as children in age and children of God, also have to look for that. You have to begin to tune your eyes to see and meet the Lord where he engages you. I pray that through your faith journey that you will be able to see that and to engage and see where the Lord is meeting you. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you continue to meet us. You meet us where we are. You met Elijah in the cave as he hid in fear and silently spoke to him, empowering him to do your work. You met the three men in the fiery furnace, encouraging them that their faithfulness to you would not go unnoticed empower them in their journey. You meet Abraham here as a group of travelers. And you remind him that the covenant you made with him is true and that you will bless his family. Help us, Lord, to look for you, to find you, to see you when we meet you. Help these young people to have their hearts and spirits so attuned yours, Lord, that they don't have a moment go unnoticed where you have met them. Encourage them and uplift them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we, as our choir brings their anthem for you, the lyrics have been placed in the online bulletin for you to, to be able to join in and sing as you would like.
Abraham and Sarah have settled in Mamre, established their living situation, and begun raising cattle, living in that place, the place that God had called them to so many years ago, the place that God had showed them. They've already withstood a disagreement amongst their family and a split. They've gone separate ways from Lot in order that the livestock would have plenty of space to graze and that those tending the flocks wouldn't continue to argue over what they refer to as the most fertile of pasture. During the most heated portion of this day, we read in Scripture, we see God appear to Abraham. Abraham was resting in the doorway of his tent when he saw three men in front of him. Abraham doesn't wait for them to come all the way to the tent, but gets up and runs out to greet them, to meet them because they aren't people that he knew. Abraham bows in front of them and implores them to come and rest at his home and allow him to show them hospitality. It's debated whether or not Abraham knew that this was God coming or the Lord coming or whether it was just someone else that he knew or that he didn't know. But throughout the encounter, we see Abraham taking it upon himself regardless of what he knew to show hospitality to his guests. He knew that they would be thirsty. He knew that they would be hungry because of their travels. Maybe this is an assumption of his that they had traveled far, but it's equally possible that he was doing what he felt was how you welcomed and loved people. People you didn't know. People who you crossed paths. Hospitality is something that I wonder if we actually fully understand. And I wonder sometimes, too, if it has changed over the years or been distorted in the ways, in ways by our culture and the world. The things done in hospitality in our Christian lives are things with intention of cultivating relationships. The ways that we show hospitality are intentional. Intentional in making people feel welcome, comfortable, and they're meant to cultivate connection with the people you're with. Through these actions, it also assists us in building relationships. Too often, though, I think we can falsely understand hospitality as being what we experience from a concierge at a hotel or from the hospitality folks at resorts or restaurants. You see, the reality is that this hospitality is done seeking something else in return. Most of these places specifically seek to receive your business again. However, that isn't what or how I understand hospitality in our Christian lives. Because we offer our hospitality to people seeking nothing in return. Seeking to encourage, to cultivate relationship, to uplift, and to love on people. It's what Corey Ten Boom's family did, always even when it was at the risk of their own lives. You may remember her family from studies in history or stories from World War II. Her family was torn apart by the Nazis. Most of her immediate family died in concentration camps due to their harboring of Jews during the war. It was a willing sacrifice they made because of their heart for God, their heart for from God for hospitality. In, Corey, in Corey's book, In My Father's House, she writes reflecting on her family's 
penchant for taking in guests and how she remembered it as a child. She says, many lonesome people found a place with us where there was music, humor, interesting conversations, and always room for one more at our oval dining room table. Oh, it's true, the soup may have been a little watery when too many unexpected guests came, but that didn't matter. Her mother loved guests. She continues and recounts Mother's lovely blue eyes would brighten. She would pat her dark hair into place when she knew we would be squeezing another visitor around the table. Already bursting, the table already bursting with four children, three aunts, herself, and Papa. With a flourish, she would place a little box on the table, spreading her arms wide. She would say to our visitor, You are welcome in our house. Because we are grateful for you coming, we will add a penny to the blessing box for our missionaries. She recalls the times when her family showed hospitality and was actually excited to have people gather. They welcomed them as if they were always meant to be there, treated them like family, and strived to make them feel as though they were a part can remember as a young child a similar time in my life, in my own family, when something similar was done. There was a very young single woman, single mother, who was invited into our home by my family. And I can remember my parents setting that example. It's something that was very common amongst the folks of my church when I was a young child something that taught hospitality. It's the same hospitality that would later be showed to my family when we were displaced during the hurricane. It's what Abraham does and did here. He welcomed these unknown men to sit with him, to join his family. He offered them water to wash their feet, something that was commonly done because of the way that people traveled and the shoes that they wore. And then he offers them bread. And they are willing to sit and rest there. So Abraham runs off excited. Sometimes I think the excitement shows because he actually teaches, well, not teaches, but he tries to tell his wife how to make the cakes. You know, to get the flour and to knead it and to make the cakes for them. He tries to give that instruction in his excitement. Then he goes and runs to the field and gets a tender calf and has it prepared to serve to the men. He even brings them milk and curds. The morsel of bread that scripture talks about Abraham offering turns into an impromptu feast for these strangers and travelers that come to Abraham's home. But there's something in the way that Abraham does this thing way that he welcomes them and encourages them to take their shoes off and stay a while. And they do it. Just think about the time that it took to prepare this meal for them. And they lounged there with Abraham. Abraham wanted them to feel at home. There are ways that we do this similarly for people when they come into our own home. You see, we're called to be hospitable to one another and to the stranger. Hebrews 13, 2 tells us, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. It's a part of a portion of scripture in Hebrews that's encouraging us to be hospitable and Christ-like in loving one another. There is such great power that is in how we are hospitable to one another. And it goes beyond welcoming folks for dinner or into our homes. It's how we interact with one another on so many levels. It's a part of who we are as Christian people. It's a part of our character. 
And I'm not sure if I can completely explain it, but I know that I've encountered it and so have you. I've encountered someone who's hospitable and you can hear it in the conversation that you're having, in their interactions with you. When we're hospitable to one another, we're in turn showing, showing hospitality to God. It's through relationships that we're able to cultivate reconciliation. That we're able to convey and encourage repentance and salvation. Sometimes it's difficult to cultivate that. To encourage, to comfort, or to even partner with people. Even now we experience hurdles at showing hospitality to one another. Because the traditional avenues of doing so are things that we're trying to avoid. And in our avoidance of these things, we are in some ways still showing hospitality. Still showing our love from God. It doesn't negate, though, that we still have to be willing to show that hospitality. Hospitality that's calling us to be more creative than we've been before. You know, hospitality can cause us to use every ounce of our creativity at times. And I think now is one of those times in testing that creativity. That creativity in being hospitable. But God's meeting us here. And giving us the ability to do that. To do what we're called to do. We, we have to be willing be hospitable to God in our lives as well as others. This portion of scripture ends with the Lord asking Abraham a question. And through it, I think, asking Sarah the same. It's one related to their encounter, and not solely about her ability to have children at her age, I think. The Lord says, is anything too wonderful for God? I think as much as it is a question about Sarah's barrenness and then having a child, it is a question that we can apply to being hospitable to others. A question meant for every situation, every difficult thing that we may encounter, and the result that we look toward is anything too wonderful for God. We have no idea the limits of God's power. Even if God puts a limitation on God's power. Is the ability of God to do more than we can ever think or imagine just on the other side of our willingness to open up? Opening our doors to all, opening our hearts to all, reminding them or telling them for the first time they're created by God and loved by God. When we are willing to open our hearts and doors, inviting relationship, often we are surprised by what we find. I pray that we are people, that we are people of creative hospitality, creatively showing it to our neighbors and others and the world, even when it's difficult, even when inviting them into our home is not the thing to do that we are able to still show our hospitality, our love for others as we serve God and as we serve others. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for giving us the ability to be hospitable people. For strengthening us in our creative abilities to show your hospitality and love to the world. Empower us, Lord, and enable us to be willing to open up and share with one another. So I truly believe that there is nothing too wonderful.
nothing too wonderful for you to accomplish, for you to do in this world, and for you to do through us. Encourage us and help us to be willing to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand together and join our voices in singing hymn 403, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Together join in unison as we affirm what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we join together in our prayers for one another and for our world, I invite you to look back at our prayer list and continue to remember those people listed there. As we continue to pray for them, for their healing, and for their strength, for their comfort, for the families that have lost loved ones, for those needing healing from the Lord. Some that were brought this week were to continue to lift up Harold Connor or Ebby Batchelor or Reuben Mercer or 
Jonna and Lil Alston, for the many families here recently that have experienced loss of loved ones, and for those experiencing difficulty in the wildfires that are taking place in Arizona. I have a ministry colleague and friend that is a pastor at a church in Tucson, and many folks there at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church have been impacted by these wildfires, as well as many others in the area. So we need to remember them and uplift them in our prayers. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you continue to tune your ears to our voices. When our hearts can't express the burden of our souls, when our prayers, we can't find words for that the Holy Spirit brings them on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, for our world, for this time during the pandemic, Lord, that where we see numbers and cases rising in our area, where hospitalizations have continued to rise. Lord, we know that we can come to you. We lift our concerns for that before you. I pray, Lord, that you would remove this virus from the world. Lord, we pray, too, as well, that you would guide doctors and researchers in coming up, devising vaccines and medications would, that would treat this virus. We pray, Lord, that you continue to make us vigilant in our response to it, continuing to protect one another, continuing to do what's right in response. Strengthen, Lord, the health care workers and those in the medical profession those working on the front lines of this continue to strengthen them, continue to bless them, continue to bring healing on those who have, who have contracted the virus. We pray, Lord, for our world as well as it, as it cries out, that we would listen and we would respond and that we would continue to be people sharing and showing your love for one another. We pray, Lord, for those in Arizona who are experiencing the effects of these wildfires, fires that have consumed over 4,000 acres, Lord, and that begin to cause families to need to move from their homes forced and recommended evacuations. Lord, we pray for those who are affected by this. That you would encourage them, that you would uplift them, that you would protect them, and Lord, that you would bring rain. That you would be with the firefighters and those who are working against these fires, that you would bring strength to them, that you would bring reprieve, and that you would stop these fires. Pray you continue to bless us, Lord, as we uplift those on our prayer list, Lord, and those that we name now, needing healing and comfort and strength. For Harold Connor, for Evie Batchelor, for Reuben Mercer, for John and Will Alston. For those, Lord, in our church family and in our community that have endured the loss of loved ones, we pray that you would be with them. You would be with their families and bring encouragement. You would be with them and, and strengthen them. We thank you, Lord, for your son and for all that he has taught us. We thank you for how he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us.
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jesus gathered the disciples and gave them authority to heal the sick, cast out our evil, and proclaim the good news. Let us present our offerings for the mission of the church, bearing witness to the kingdom of God. being able to reflect on those gifts you've given to us and to give back as a way of thanksgiving, of worship, and of praise for all you do for us. We pray, Lord, that you bless us, your church. We take these gifts and we serve you in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us stand together and join our voices in singing hymn 439. In Christ there is no east or west. We'll sing verses 1 and 4.
please receive the benediction. Let us be people of creativity as we serve the Lord, finding new ways to be hospitable to those around us. As we cross paths with so many, may we be people of grace, love, and mercy from Christ, welcoming them to wash their feet and dine with us. The Lord bless your going out and your coming in. The Lord bless you with peace. The Lord bless you as you bless others. In his name. Alleluia.